live. All right, Peter. <laughs> Here we are at another episode of Flipping Houses for Rookies. Good morning, Bill. Hey, Peter. How are you? I'm doing okay. Episode number 217, Peter. 217. Oh, yeah. That's got 21 in it. It's got one in it. It's got seven in it. Damn, this is a lucky this is a lucky episode. Oh, my God. Looks like you're going to play the lotto today, aren't you? <laughs> no, worse than that. Flowers for my wife's birthday. Okay. <laughs> I get her a lotto ticket. I never buy those. <laughs> yeah, I gamble on uh, real estate. Ah, and me. There you go. There and you. you. That's what there I gamble you go. on. There you uh, go. It's my gamble. Here we go, Peter. You ready All for right. today's juicy topic? I'm ready to find out what the hell it is. I never know. How to properly manage lease options profitably. Manage. Okay. It is a well-known fact that real estate investors make their money while they negotiate the buy. Mm-hmm and collect these profits once sold. So this bears the question, how do you manage the lease option sale profitably? You worked really hard to find, negotiate, and close this deal. Then you were clever on finding the right buyer, get your deposit, do the contracts, and put them in the house but how do you manage the property so you get paid on time? Plus, make sure required repairs and maintenance are done and done correctly. What if the tenant wants to add a deck or a new bathroom or refinish the basement? What happens if the tenant is late with the payment or worse, misses a payment? Mm. How about helping them get a mortgage, or fixing their credit like you promised. In this podcast, we are going to have an unusual conversation about all of these topics. So once you are done listening, you can have a way, uh, a way to, it's supposed to, I can't read my own writing, a better way to understand <clears throat> of what you do when selling on a lease option profitably and successfully. So mm -hmm. gra grab something to write with and let's go. I'm glad you're doing this one. You know, you, we talk so much about getting the properties, but not too much about what happens when we have them. And I wonder if that makes people nervous not knowing this step. So this got to be really helpful. <clears throat> right. Be more sure of yourself, knowing what you're doing and not worry about it. Totally. Yeah. So before we get started, we got to do some housework here. So, uh, make sure you subscribe to whatever channel you're listening to, whether it's a podcast uh, platform, it's YouTube, it's Facebook, anything like that. Make sure you send us some reviews. We love reviews. If you go to FlippingHousesForRookies.com and you scroll down the page, uh, four or five, uh, not even, uh, about a quarter way down the page, the podcast is there <coughs> right below that podcast uh, section because it's got all the different podcasts in it in a box. There's a review link there. So just go to FlippingHousesForRookies.com, scroll down, look for the podcast box, and underneath it, it says review. Okay? Or you can go to the top of the page where it says, uh, uh, what does it say? Uh, how it works or proof it works. And you can leave a testimonial. I love the testimonials, especially when people leave them on video. Okay? And <clears throat> Peter... I stepped up the game yet again. What did you do now, Bill? So now we are broadcasting as of today on Facebook. We're live streaming. We are on YouTube live streaming. Now we're on Twitter live streaming. <laughs> we're everywhere, I mean, Peter. I didn't even know Twitter could do that. <laughs> I see well, pictures and then little short videos. Yeah, that's cool. So. Uh, so if you use any one of those platforms, feel free to go there and check us out. You know, it's been amazing to me, a little bit of a diversion here, because uh, Emma and my coach, Will, uh, the guy that I that helps me a lot with my business is Will Irish. Uh, you should go find him. Uh, I don't know if he'll coach you. He's kind of a, uh, 
I, I don't know if he'll help you, but you can go find him on Facebook. I know he does a lot of Facebook ad training. Uh, so it's Will Will Irish. Uh, and you could just type in Will Irish on Facebook and you can find him. And, in any event, <clears throat> him and Emma, <clears throat> they not only had to bring out the pistols, but they had to bring out the shotguns and then the cannons and then threaten to burn my house down to like to like get me to like do all of this because I was like, ah, I don't want to do all that. So Emma found a platform which we're using now, which is called StreamYard, and it allows me to do that. And actually, I had to apologize to you the other day because it's like really simple to use, a lot easier than the other stuff. Uh, and like you notice, we just bing, bang, boom, we go right on. Where before yeah. I would have to, I'd have to fiddle around with it. I have to get Facebook and, and, and all this stuff. Uh, but my point in telling you all that is, is that uh, I think what I figured out is that some people don't like flake book. I mean, I don't. Bill, the kids, today, my, my sons, like the millennials or 20, 30s and 40. No, they just, yeah. they, they don't, they don't even look at it. And I was watching the news this morning on Fox News and that dirty, rotten, liberal scumbag that runs Facebook was on there telling his opinions about political. And he's like, anything that's Republican, he takes off of the platform. So he could just go to hell, that son of a bitch. There you go. I've yeah. said my piece. Hey, right or wrong, that's not American. That's not the way we do things. Yeah, exactly. We don't so, do things. So anyways, the point is, is that uh, a lot of people listen to us on uh, YouTube. We were missing a whole audience there by because people just didn't want to go on Flickbook. Yeah. So there you go. All right. So enough of that chit chat and that political talk. We're not supposed to talk about what, Peter? Politics, religion, what else? Death. Our wives. Oh, death. <laughs> taxes. Taxes. Ta taxes, yeah. Taxes. Uh, I can get going on that, too. How the hell with it? Let's All right. It. So it seems like we talk a, a, a lot about acquiring houses, which you said before, and mm -hmm. even how to get buyers in the in the newly acquired properties. So we talk about how do we find them, how do we close them, what do we say, but we never really seem to talk about what do we do once we have them. Mm -hmm. You know, like like after the D Day. You know what this is like? This is like boy meets girl. Girl, boy proposes the girl, marries girl. Right, yeah. boy, boy gets girl, girl gets girl pregnant, girl has baby. Then you're like, okay, so white picket fence, you know, married, blah blah blah, like you did the American dream, and then all of a sudden you have a wife and you have a kid or you have a husband and you got a kid and it's like, oh shit, now what? Yeah, how do we now we do this? Now we got to live together. We got this little baby, you know. I know because my, Jesse just went through this. My my twenty nine year old. It's like you know, it's watching her go through the adjustments. Well, it's the same type of a thing. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, oh, now we got this tenant. We got this house. Now what? You know, what am I supposed to do? What am I not supposed to do? Yeah. Right? Yep. But so, even though I say that you're going to be a landlord. I mean, you're going to be you're going to collect the rent without being a landlord. There are still things you have to do. And I thought, hmm, I need to make sure that I clarify this because, you know, I don't want to have people think that it's just like, you know, you go into work in the morning, you punch your time card, and then you go sit on the recliner on the beach, and you're like, just keep collecting your checks because you're like there. I mean, it's it is almost that, but it's not quite that. There are things you have to do every single month. Okay. Sure. Yeah, we need to know that. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so there's things like, uh, you know, like I said, I promote a lot about how to rent and all that kind of stuff. And, but what about all this stuff? Like, what about how you manage the repairs and maintenance? Mm -hmm. Right. And I know I say that you don't have to do repairs and maintenance. Well, if the house breaks and the tenant doesn't do it, what do you do now? Well, yeah, it's your investment. You got to do something with it. Right. How about managing the payments? Mm -hmm. Like, like check arrives, you deposit it, pay mortgage. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you think that that's simple, but what happens when you get two or four or fifteen or twenty? Sure. Right. What happens now? I right? keep track of all that. Yeah. So, how about managing the payments if they're missed or late? Right. What do you do? What about if the tenant wants to, like I said earlier, what if what if they want to put a re renovate a bathroom or put a new bathroom in or put a deck on or refinish the basement? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, they are buying a house. You you should allow them to do something. So how right. do you manage all that? 
I haven't gone through that yet, but I did see something that, wow, what if they don't do a good job? Right. <laughs> what if they do it wrong? Yeah. What if it costs more money to fix what they did? Right. Then what about their credit? I mean, you're telling them because you listen to me, you tell them, oh, well, we'll help you get a mortgage. Well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Hey, right? I'll pick you up Tuesday. We'll go down to the bank and we'll yeah. talk to the president. Yeah, go see right. my. We'll help go you out. Go see my buddy Guido. He'll take care hey, of you. Hey, you watch that. You watch that. <laughs> you freaking Italian started that whole mob thing. What's up with that, anyways? Hey, bank of England, not the yeah. best in the world. Yeah. And then the Chinese followed you, and the Russians followed. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the they, yeah, they, they, yeah, they. They know a good pattern when they see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then, uh, finally, what happens when they're ready to close? What do you do? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, this is something like what to do, but not exactly how. So you're going to show us some of the hows today. I'm gonna I'm gonna work on it a little bit. Yeah. We get us steer us in the right direction at least. So. Uh, like I said, it, it occurred to me that this is a whole section of the business that we just never talk about. Mm. Nobody talks about it. It's not sexy. You know what I mean? Well, the big adventure is getting one. That's the hard part, quote, you know? Well, look, I got one. I got one. I got one. You know what do you do with it? Well, then you can call me and call some of my leads. What did I just tell you? I got 168 leads and my VA is not working. So uh, uh, what do I do now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. not worried about finding a house. I'm worried about getting my ass to work. Mm -hmm. Well, you're ahead of a lot of people on that, but you know, when you're starting now, they don't know how to get they don't know how to get the houses like you do. So, uh, if you want to know how to do that, I just started a uh, a monthly a deal hunting monthly mastery course. Uh, last night was the first time, and and I had you know I had a hand you know well, not more than a handful of people. I had some I had a small group on there. I think we had like twenty people, fifteen or twenty people, and it went really good. And I started off by telling them that I tricked them. The whole mastery <laughs> thing is a big, fat illusion. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm going to teach you how to get houses, but what I'm really going to do is push your ass to get in the houses. Yeah. You know, like, don't go try to buy a house. Just go talk to somebody. Just go in the house and just talk to somebody, and that's what I'm going to push you to do. Now, this deal hunting mastery is uh, it's $97 a month, but I give them, like, $1,500 with the stuff, right? And mm -hmm. and it and it was really good. It, we had we had a lot of, but that's that's where I teach how to find leads. So if you want to know how to get 168 leads, then you got to be part of that group. I guess it's a coaching group. You get a lot of help, uh, all that stuff. <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> Johnny says, put your leads to your students. <laughs> hey, I was thinking that this morning. Like, if you really get stuck, you know, I'm going like, to be doing that. I have another I'm level of coaching. On the job training. Yeah, I have another level of coaching that I haven't released that I'm going to probably release. Once I get this deal hunting mastery thing done, uh, you're going to be able to uh, – it'll be a, the third level. So right now we have deal hunting mastery where you come in and you learn how to do deal hunting. Once you start finding the deals, you go to the weekly coaching. Uh, the deal hunting mastery is $97. The weekly most uh, coaching is um, – it's 500 bucks a month, and I help you a lot. I help you make deals. And I'm going to have another level that's going to be, I don't know, $700 or $800. And there, I actually find you the leads. I have my VA call them. Your boot's on the ground, and we partner on the deals. Mm. So what do you think is going to happen when that goes on? Oh, my God, I'm going to pull my hair out. But I got to get it I got to get it under wraps a little bit before I do that. So it's coming, John. It's coming. Desiree said, stop teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we're not here to talk about that. So uh, so it occurred to me that this is a whole section of the business no one talks about. Okay? And let me put the bill twist on it. It's like chasing. It's like talking to girls, Peter. It's fun, but what happens when you move in together and out, uh, move in and find out she's a slob <laughs> oh, no. and doesn't brush her teeth? Uh, or shower every day. What do you do now? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, no. I think I made a mistake. Or maybe you didn't. Maybe you like that kind of thing. <laughs> maybe you that way, too. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I like to call this risk management. Okay? 
Yeah. And, but I, and I also want to make it uh, make a disclaimer. I'm not a racist or a womanizer or even worse, a slumlord. So please don't uh, take my jokes as that. Uh, I'm just a, uh, a regular guy that uh, just speaks my mind. Speaks and mind. just like our, our, our president, Mr. Trump, I say what I'm going to say, and I don't give a shit what everybody else says. Hey, so Bill, when I was a kid, and probably you too, everybody just said whatever they felt like. Comedians would go on stage and make fun of everybody, themselves, the wops in the in the hall. <laughs> hey, you, I mean, just just think hey. you say everything. So it's an equal opportunity. No, 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 Peter, I'm not going for that. I'm not going for that. All you got to do is say, when we grew up, we watched Archie Bunker. That <laughs> covers it all. <laughs> so there you go. But uh, no arch. There ain't no Archie Bunker shows today. That's for sure. <laughs> that, that show was very, very helpful to get things evened out. How about how about Mash, where the guys are in a, in, in a camp chasing girls and <laughs> drinking liquor all the time, right? Yeah, <laughs> that wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> well, more real, <laughs> more real than a John Wayne movie. <laughs> yeah, right. Everybody saints and angels. <laughs> so I want to make sure that you know, if you send me support tickets, I'm gonna I got a special button on my computer. It's called Delete. I'm not even gonna answer you. Delete. Okay, so forget that shit. All right. Uh, but I like to make sure when I talk to someone in, and when I take to someone into my fold, well, they have to play by my rules. And that's just pretty much how it is. Uh, I'm not like some, you know, uh, authority figure and it's like I have to have control or a control freak. Uh, when I do my deals and you know as well as I did, well, you and I went through it because when we bought the last three family we had, right, we kind of went, you, you kind of went, a little bit lenient on the tenants and then later back later on came back and said to me i, sh I have to do that different next time yeah i mean right. the first time going in i didn't realize you know i'm, I'm used to dealing with people that just do what they're supposed to do right. so I, I couldn't tell how much to lean on them but and i know you were thinking in your head you didn't say it to me but i was just being you, you thought i was just being a hard ass or you know a jerk about it but it's like you gotta you gotta hit it you gotta like you know, like my daddy always taught me, you know, when, when you got when you got the bully coming around, you know, the bully's always got two or three guys around him, you know. You got to figure out, first of all, which one's the ringleader, and you pop him in the head first. You know, <laughs> yeah. you go right after that guy first, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like that, you know. Yeah. So you just got to – you got to be – somebody's got to be in control because otherwise what happens is, is you end up with cities with riots and want to take down statues and people don't listen. So – so my magic pixie dust is preparing my buyers before we start the relationship. So that is a golden jewel. Johnny says Mel Brooks. Oh my God. <laughs> Dwayne wants to know, I said, let's get to meet contracts and slot deals. Uh, Dwayne, we're not going to do that in this podcast at all. There's another podcast that you can get that on. It's all about the paperwork. Uh, I don't know what number it is, but if you go listen to that, I cover all the paperwork there. So uh, I'm reading, for the people that are not aware, I'm reading uh, comments off of Facebook and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, Peter, the, the, the real secret in my success is um, – preparing the buyers and the sellers too, right, at the beginning of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So at, from the first intervention, whether it be on the telephone or whether I meet them at the property or a text, I set, I, I'm set. i constantly setting the pace on how it's going to be, right? Right. I bring out all the bad stuff first. That's just my nature. It's like it, – it's what Ben Settle, who's my, who's one of my, you know, I aspire to his stuff. Ben Settle's an underground copywriter that teaches guys like me how to write. And that's important because uh, just recently I've been talking about, I mean, I personally write between 17 and 20,000 words a week, Jeez. you know, between the podcast and the, emails and you know some content and 
you know, web pages. So, you know, so having a mentor like Ben Settle is huge for a guy like me, right? Uh, I talk to seven or 8,000 people a week, right? Between the podcast and emails and telephone and texting and all that kind of stuff. So I'm constantly, you know, words are everything to me. Right. So well, that's, all, that's all they're getting, especially if it's like a text or an email. They're not getting your speech and your inflections, your, your intention, your mood. You're just getting the words on a piece of paper. Right. Right. So Ben settles a, a, a tremendous influence for me. But anyways, he calls this making the skeleton dance. Really? Oh, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Which, by the way, if you want to go to Ben Settle, it's bensettle.com. He, he has amazing stuff. If you, if you want to just even just get on his email list, he, he's a good writer. His emails are like, uh, I don't know, sometimes they're a little far-fetched, but his books are amazing. Uh, the Power of Persuasion, you know, some of his persuasion books, they're just amazing. You know, uh, we've talked about them. We had him on this uh, podcast. I had him yeah. on here at one time, right? But the, what I'm talking about right now is is making the skeleton dance. In other words, people have skeletons in the closet, right? And they try to hide them. Oh, uh, Okay. Not me. I take that some bitch right out of the closet and I make a dance in front of you. Like, here's all the bad crap. Like, if we can get through that, then we're good. Because <laughs> this is the worst it'll ever get. So when I'm when I'm talking to a buyer, I don't I don't make it derogatory or I don't make it like dangerous or I just let them know. By the way, when you give me your ten grand, if you don't go to closing, you're gonna lose it. I'm gonna keep yeah. it. Or by the way, you're paying a couple extra hundred dollars more for your rent because I'm the big fat landlord and uh, I want you to get a mortgage and I'm charging you too much money. So realize when you pay seventeen hundred, you could get a mortgage for fourteen or fifteen hundred, and you're paying me to be here. You know, so that's like making the skeleton dance because I like tell them to their face like this is what's going to happen, and I start that kind of stuff like right up front. Like for example, I'm texting somebody. And they're coming to look at the house. I'll tell them, you know, uh, the the rugs are dirty and the and the paint it doesn't need paint. So just when you get there, don't expect some pretty house. It is a handyman special. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't do that on everybody, but if I have somebody that's like, you know, asking me some funky ass questions like, what color are the walls? I'm like, whoa, put the brakes on. You know, this is not how it's going to be. The color of the walls are going to be whatever you paint them. Yeah. Because you're going to need the paint. Yeah. You know what I mean? So so you kind of set the pace up front. And I'm not talking about doing this. There's not like some standard, unique like way to do this, but you just set the pace early on. You don't try to make it sound better than what it is. No, what you're doing is really <clears throat> smart. Um, I've worked with people who have done stuff like that. I've seen people in a conversation when the guy twitches and, you know, I go, oh, geez, something's wrong. Jeez, I better, uh, gee, I hope it's going to be okay. And you don't talk about it. The guy twitches, you go, what's the matter? Right. I'm worried about this. Oh, let's talk about it. You're better off spinning it out up front than uh, than having the person think about it later and bring it up later and make a big stink out of it. Get it out of the way. Right. So we have to set some rules, right? Mm -hmm. So in our apartment business, we have a an apartment's rules and regulation document, okay, which we have a lot of documents. So I realized that yesterday when, when I was looking for this, we have a lot of documents. You and I have a lot of documents. Yeah. And 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 I'm sorry. Uh, uh, some of them I just won't share because I've either paid a lot of money or some of them I got from somebody else and they have copyright stuff on them. And you have to go buy them too. You know, we've and we've paid. I've paid thousands and tens of thousands of dollars for my documents. Like this this document that I'm going to read from right now. I think we paid fifteen hundred for a package of documents, or two thousand, mm -hmm. or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let me, I'm going to read a couple of these just so you can get an idea. Now, we don't always use this on the single-family houses, but you can adapt these. You can change this document for those people, and we and I've done that, right? So <clears throat> it starts off with saying all tenants, occupy occupants, and guests will comply with apartment rules, which which are currently in effect, including all local and government governmental laws and such other and such other and future rules as we may make for the safety, care, and cleanliness and good order of the property or the comfort, quiet, and convenience of other residents and neighbors. Additional rules shall become effective upon notice 
Failure to comply with these rules shall, at your at your option, be considered a default of rental agreement and may result in termination of tenancy. All present and future house rules will be considered a formal part of your rental agreement. That's the first paragraph, mm. right? That's pretty inclusive. And it's it's a two-page document, and they sign it, saying that they read it because we read it to them. So it's not we don't we don't want to make sure that they misunderstand something, and then later on they tell the judge, I didn't "Get it, judge." No, we we read it to them, right? So uh, another one is rent must be paid by the fourth of each month, or a late fee will be charged. Right. Uh, apartment and halls must be kept clean in all at all times, including sweeping and washing of halls. Now, in this particular case, if you're doing a single family house, you would just say it has to be clean. Like our lease actually says, you got to clean the place because if we got to come in and do pest control, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you violated the lease. The lease. If we got to go in and clean up bugs, ah, 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 no can do. Take a shower, mop your floor, take the garbage out because no can do. Right? You got to be strict with this stuff. How about this one? All windows must be properly covered with curtains yeah. or, or drapes and properly hung. No newspapers, blankets, sheets, flags, or other substance may be used for curtains or drapes. Now, why would we do that, Peter? There's nobody that would put an American flag as a curtain in their window in our neighborhoods, would they? No, can't be. Not in Connecticut. No. That's what city you live in. No adding or changing persons living in, a par in the apartment or in the facility without written consent of the landlord. So when we write our lease, we ask, who's living in the house? Mm -hmm. Right? Only residents listed on rental agreement are to occupy the unit. Now, why would we do that? We wouldn't for one second have a, a family move in that's got 35 people in it, would we? No, that can't happen around here. No, oh, they're just visiting. Yeah. No water beds or liquid-filled furniture allowed. Hmm. Such right. things leak. Here we go. This one's a good one. This one's a good one. Mm -hmm. No car repairs are permitted. Yeah, right. They get out in front and there's there's uh, <laughs> there's cars up on uh, stands and yeah, that's great. No foreign objects in toilets or drains. No sanitary napkins, tampons, grease, diapers, or anything harmful or obstructive to the drains. Mm -hmm. Now, now I'm not going to go through them. I'm going to read one or two more things, but I would like to tell you about this repair thing. This is in my apartments. We don't have this much trouble with the uh, single family because in the single family houses, we let them know up front that they're responsible for the repairs, right? Yeah. yeah. But in my apartments, what I do is I'll tell my tenants, like right now I have a, you heard me on the phone just before we started, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I have a girl says that she's got a gas leak. So I told her to call the gas company. Well, it's not that bad. She wants the plumber to come out and look at it. Okay, good. In most cases, what I tell her is, is, well, if I come out and it's a neglect point on you, then you need to pay the plumber before he leaves. Mm -hmm. Like if they got a clogged toilet and they shoved a diaper down there or something else. That's right. They need to pay the plumber before they leave. You do that once in one with one tenant in one building and guess what you never get again. Yeah, you don't get those stupid calls. Right. Well, they're yeah. like children. You told me this. They're like children. You let them get away with something, they do. So uh, uh, the buildings or the rents uh, are to be used as private living quarters. No business is allowed in a premises. This includes no babysitting or daycare allowed. Right? Mm -hmm. Insurance. We do not insure your personal property. We suggest you obtain renter's insurance to cover your own valuables and cover you for liability. So... My point is, is that when you set when you set the pace up front, right, mm -hmm. and you tell them these type of things before they enter the agreement, right, then it get it's easier. It's hard in the beginning because you might lose some people, but then when you get the right people, it becomes less painful later. No, it's funny with the right people because I've I've had a few tenants in one of my properties, uh, you know, a little turnover and. Uh, when I pick them, boy, they turn out good. 
you say, uh, you know, I want you to get, make sure you get your own rent. You go, sure. Can you show me the copy of the policy? And they sent it to me. There it is. Good. All right. Done. Mm -hmm. worry about, especially the liability part, you know, right. They lose their, their, their personal merchandise or property. That's one thing it's on them. But if they, if they don't have liability, well, guess who does you, then they got to come see you. So have, make sure they do that. They send you a copy. They fax it. It over. gets, you it's know? even easier than that, Peter, because one of my coaching clients, Phil, who's did me a huge favor, introduced to me a couple months ago, uh, cozy.co. Mm -hmm. Cozy.co. They collect the payments from the tenants. For $2.99 a month, they do the disbursements. So that means if you're paying me a rent of uh, 1500 a month and I got to pay my, my, my lender, you know, $1,000 and I got to pay 200 in taxes and 100 in insurance, you tell them what checks to write and the 1500 comes in and they automatically send those checks out. So everything's paid. Yeah, nice. The reason why I bring that up now is because they have in their system renter's insurance for 20 bucks a month. So you just add it to the rent. So now you pay fifteen hundred and twenty. You're paying the rent and the renter's insurance. That's cool. And it's like it's all like easy one payment. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So most important success factor about renting any type of a facility. This is number one on the list, Peter. Number one, most important. Everything, everything has to be in writing. Oh, exactly. No verbal communication at all. Now, I, I don't know if you want to talk about this, and you were clever. Your son helped you with this, but you, you we, we bought, and you, or you bought, I just uh, helped you with it, mm -hmm. uh, the condo you had. And the reason yep. why I bought the condo is because you had a, a crappy tenant in there. Yeah, the guy uh, couldn't take it anymore. So I took over, you know, you're, you're buying people's problems, you're solving problems. So you inherit some of it and you fix it because we're supposed to be professionals and know what we're doing. And he pulled all kinds of tricks. I mean, he pulled the racist trick and he pulled the landlord trick and he pulled the old man trick. I mean, he pulled every trick he could try to find. You won that case by a landslide mm -hmm. because your son was able to help you find software to download the string of texts. Mm-hmm. And you printed the text and submitted them to the court. Yep. And I believe you 100% won that case because prior to that, it wasn't looking good for you. There was a lot of uh, he said, she said, but you submitted those texts, and it was a land. It was a, it was a, it was it was just a whole lot easier from that point. Well, not to make a pun on, but it was black and white. It was just it was obvious. I handed it to the lady. She, you know, she read them. She, you know, she looked at me. She couldn't say anything right in the room at the time, but she just looked at me, looked at the guy, and she almost like went, ah, you know. Right. And then, yeah, it was. Point is, things in writing is the point, and texting. You know, don't have conversations with people. You can't prove he said. See, texting is great, and I found he, my son, helped me find a software. I printed 79 sheets of paper and handed it to the lady. She's yeah. going down, I highlighted something. Oh my God. Yeah. The person called you that, said that to you, treated right. you this way. Bah. And, and and it was months worth of, of, of communication. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I remember the day you said it to me when I was on the phone with you. It's like I'm not talking to him no more. I'm gonna make him text me everything. Yep. And that was very smart. So so everything has to be in writing. Mm-hmm. Right. Texting is great. I use it a lot in my businesses just yeah. because even with students, my music stuff, because, oh, I thought you said 5.30 to show up. No, look at your text. 4.30, get home, right. you're late. Whatever right. it is, texting is great. There's no confusion. You can just go back and look at it. Good. So let's move on to these, these steps that I have. So the first one is managing repairs and maintenance. Uh-huh. Right? Uh, the lease contract we use uh, lists out by number. They're numbered. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what the lease buyer is responsible for, and we cover it uh, at the lease signing. Mm -hmm. Each line is initialed and acknowledged that the lease buyer read it. Yeah. Okay. That's huge. So we actually either read it to them or explain it to them, and they initial it. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. I don't do this, but I have friends that do. You could put the lease uh, 
on an inspection every six to 12 months. <clears throat> so you can pay a property management company and you can get it carried away with this. You can, they can go in every six months and take pictures. And when I mean take pictures, like take pictures of the, of the, uh, ID tags on the refrigerator and on the stove and on the dishwasher and on the washing machine and the dryer, right? So you know that they haven't changed them. Hmm. And if you do this, and then they write a report, and, and, and a lot of management companies will do this, property management companies will do this. Even if you're self-managing yourself, I'm sure you can find a property manager that will go in and do this for you. Maybe you don't do it every six months. Maybe you do it once a year, right? And they go in. I never heard of that one. Oh yeah, yeah. But you do want to go, you know, check things. Like you, you can go into your own uh, unit and have somebody check, make sure the smoke alarms have the batteries that are messed up, like right. that. You know, whatever. Well, the, the the tenants are supposed to do that themselves. They're supposed to. But if you go in once a year and do an inspection, it just keeps their ethics in more than anything else. Right. Right. right? And I don't do it, and 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 I'm getting to a point where if I, you know, if I keep buying like I am buying. I'm going to have to do I'm going to have to hire a property management company. I already got a guy that I know I'm going to you know, use. Uh, mm -hmm. To be honest with you, to be 100% pompous like I always am, my concern is is that just like when I take on a lawyer or I take on an acquisition manager, it, it's not the person I'm taking on. It's the training I have to go through. So when I when I hire a property management company, I'm going to have to train them my way. Yeah. You know, and it's pretty much with that stuff, it's my way or the highway. I'm just a jerk about that stuff because my way – has proven to work multiple times, not only with me, but with my private coaching clients. Mm -hmm. So, so I know it works. They just got to be able to do that. But the point is, is that, you know, <clears throat> if you're taking pictures of all the ID, you know, I, you know, the tags, you know, the serial tags and model numbers and, and you're taking pictures of the house and you're taking a picture of the outside grounds and the roof and the basement and the furnace, you know, like, <clears throat> so like right now is a perfect example. It's September, right? Suppose, suppose I were to have somebody go in and inspect the property, and I find that there's a bunch of crap leading up against the furnace. Mm. Because in two months from now, or yeah, probably two months from now, what's going to happen? It's going to start getting chilly, and somebody's going to light the furnace. They're going to turn the furnace on, and it's not going to work because some kid's bicycle was leaned up against the the furnace motor and broke a wire. Yeah. But if I get that, if I get if I get that that data, then I know how to deal with it. So it, it's not a catch-all, but it's just a way that it, if you're nervous, Gertie, it's a way that you can manage your properties a little bit better, a little mm -hmm. bit tighter. Point is, you would build a file of pictures that are time-stamped, right, for any recordings of changes. So what so, do people do? Take a, a good appliance and sell it to somebody and put a cheap one in? Nobody does anything. You're not doing it for that reason. You're doing it to, to, to show them, don't even think about it. Uh-uh-uh. Mm. You know? Okay. I mean, the biggest, the, biggest, the biggest culprit of that is refrigerators. You know? So they'll want to put a new refrigerator in because, you know, some women like to have a certain type of refrigerator. I'm, I'm not being chauvinistic. So maybe some guys do, but usually women want a bigger refrigerator. Or, you know, because... Uh, who knows? So they want to put a stainless steel refrigerator instead of a white or a black one, right? Yeah, but that sounds like a good thing. <clears throat> no, because when they leave, they take it with them. And then you don't have a refrigerator. And then you don't have a refrigerator. Okay. Yeah. That's where you're going. Okay. Yeah. Just okay. tell them to put it in the basement. Well, the point is, is they got to <laughs> tell you in writing. That's what the point yeah, is. If and, they really and, want and, one, fine, get one, but then put the other one in the basement. Don't use it and keep it fresh for you. Put it back and then you have a a less used refrigerator it wouldn't be the terrible, but they have to let you know, right? Peter, I have to, I have to, you have to confront this, Peter. I have to let you know this. You may not know this. Yeah. There are actually dishonest people that would live in one of our houses. <laughs> no, no, that's why I'm asking you what, 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 what the, what's the bad thing that would happen. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. So the point is, is that just by having an inspection, it just keeps their ethics level up because they know you're coming to look. Well, you, so, yeah, it's like mom and don't, don't mom and dad are watching. Don't right. Mom right. and dad will catch us. They'll see us. Right. Right. 
It's like when the inspector comes around at the bank or something on and he looks at the books. If nobody ever did that, nobody would care. Right. I get it. All right, good. So let's move on to managing the payments. We good there? Yeah. So uh, the, actually, I want to go. I, I I didn't write this down. I forgot to write this down. So managing repairs and maintenance. Uh -huh. So one of the questions I get quite often when we talk about this is what happens if they don't fix the house? Yeah. Right. Like suppose the furnace stops working and it needs a $5,000 furnace. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the tenant doesn't have that repair. Right. So basically what I do is I obviously they're going to call me and tell me. And I will do the repair and I will add it to the price of the house. So if they're paying $200,000 for the house and they have a contract for $200,000, I'm going to sign, before I do the repairs, I'm going to have them sign an addendum saying that they're now paying $205,000 for the house. Mm -hmm. And I add it to the back end of the deal. Okay? Yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> now, if for any reason there's like violations, like they didn't cut the grass and the city, because the city of Meriden's like that, they're just pains in the asses. If you don't cut the grass, they send you a $200 ticket mm. right? so or whatever, a $100 ticket, whatever it is. I send that to the seller. To the I'm, seller? So, I'm, I'm sorry, I send it yeah. to the buyer. Right, because he's supposed to be mowing the lawn. Right. Send the I, I have a case right now where I just got mail. Of course, I was gone and I, got, I, had, a, I had a truckload of mail. I actually have to call sometime in the next couple of days, I don't know when I'm going to get it done, but I have to call the city of Meriden because my seller, I'm sorry, my buyer, why well, keep doing that this morning, my buyer for the Meriden house that I just closed, it was a subject to deal, was supposed to pay the water bill and didn't pay the water bill, and now I'm getting the bill of $275. Mm. But I don't own the house anymore. She bought it for me. Mm -hmm. You know, so... I mean, I made $53,000, so I got to kind of like, you know, tread lightly because I might have to write a check. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's just one of those things. Um, so. Yeah, but if you don't say anything, you don't do anything, they'll do it again and again and again. That's your point. Right, right. Well, because I, I let her get away with it to the point where we got to the closing and she had to use all her money for the closing and didn't have money for the closing. So I had to make a decision, you know, do I not close for $275? Hmm. And get a big fat check, or do I close? Well, you know? that's called taking your battles, too. Yeah. And she promised me she would do it. And I'm sure if I call her up, she'll tell me she'll go pay it. And I'll just, you know, I'm sure she will. She's been a sweetheart all the way. Because, you want to know why? She what? told me 900 times, Thank you so much, Mr. Beal. Thank you so much, Mr. Beal. I could never, I can't believe, I can't believe this actually worked. I can't believe I actually got the house bought. I can't believe I own a house. She must have told me that 900 times. So they, they already closed on it? Yeah, this is uh, this is Side Hill Road. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the, right. Yeah, I'm thinking of the, the newer one you got. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Oh, Peter, I forgot to tell you something. Oh, my God, I got I got to tell you this. Oh, my God. What? I, I probably shouldn't do this on a podcast, but I got to tell you because I'll forget later. What? <laughs> so I'm on the, on the monthly master last night. Yeah. And we're poking around looking. You know, I'm showing people how to find houses, especially on uh -huh. Facebook. Uh -huh. The freaking house we just sold in Meriden yeah. is for rent. What? It's for rent. The one we just sold in Meriden is for rent. For rent, nine hundred a month. What the hell does that mean? I don't. He, whoever bought it from us must have been an investor or something, and they're renting it. Well, that's not very smart. <laughs> so what did I do? I don't know. Did you call and see if you can do a lease option on it? I sent a text to him and said, would you be willing to lease the house for a year or two and then I can buy it? <laughs> he said no. He said no. I tell you what, he he took all of our pictures off, off of the internet and he's got them advertised for rent. Remember all the pictures we took yeah. when we were selling it? Yeah, he had, had, <laughs> had snow on the grass. <laughs> oh. He had all my pictures that we took. I couldn't believe it. Oh, Jesus. Anyways. I'm goofing around too much sure. this morning. Next one is managing the payments. <clears throat> I still do mine in house. We were just talking about this. Uh, we're getting. I'm getting ready to switch it over though, because uh, it's getting to be too much. Like like today, I got to put away a couple hours. I got to deal with it. Um, it's the third of September, and I'm like, I should have done it already. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, but I'm like, uh, but pay attention to this. My coaching client Phil that I just told you about uh, introduced me to Cozy.co. 
Uh, these guys received their uh, rent payments and they and the insurance, and I just explained all that for two dollars and ninety nine cents a door. So, so suppose you got ten ten doors. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost you thirty bucks. How much is it going to cost you for a bookkeeper? Twenty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she charges me more than twenty, though you dog. <laughs> no, she Can, does. Can convince her while you're out there uh, whining or dining her for her birthday that you got to give Bill a better rate. <laughs> Anyways, we'll, these guys. We'll talk, we'll talk later because I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to pay off, so. No, that, you, no, that includes my commission. My yeah, exactly. Yeah, I bet it does. So if you get up uh, to paying the seller, you know, taxes and all that, then then pretty much what happens is is the dream of your of your mailbox, quote unquote, becoming an ATM machine is a lot closer, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, honest to God, Peter, I, I think I have. In fact, I was talking to, talking to Steve the other day about this, and he was kind of giving me a hard time about it. I still have two or three properties with my with my partner that uh, he's going to steal the equity from me. I already know he's going to do it. I know it when I did the deal. Um, my point is, is uh, we 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 broke up. You know, uh, we went our own ways in May of 2009. Mm -hmm. We have three properties. Now, we had those properties for two or three years. I keep saying that they've been in the house for 10 years. When I was talking to Steve the other day, they've actually been there 15 years. Or more. I have a lease option and haven't closed to buy the house. They had a two-year lease option, and they kept paying, and I didn't say nothing, and they just keep paying. Imagine that. Well, you know, it's not bad for you because the equity keeps going down. It's just more profit to you. But why would they do that? So my point is it was a set it and forget it scenario. So when you have this cozy thing set up, it yeah. could be a set it and forget it scenario. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I bought them subject to and the other end didn't care. They went, you know, went wherever they did or whatever they did. And they have they probably don't even remember the mortgages in their name. Yeah. And I said, I forget it. And I just collect my money, and there you go. So yeah. cozy is good for that, right? Nice. All right. So the next one is managing late or missed payments. Mm. Believe it or not, this is the easiest part of the whole oh. system. Oh, good, because it sounds like the most annoying part. And it's the most uncomfortable. Well, that part, yeah. Okay. Which is why most don't do it well. Mm-hmm. Because we have feelings, Peter. We have feelings. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to be a liberal right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not working. It is not working. All right. Here's the trick. When they're late, you throw a tantrum. Mostly with letters. Mm. All right. So... I'm going to read, uh, again, like I said, we have a lot of documents. I don't think you need all these documents, but I'm going to read some of the documents that we can send and we have. And when I mean these documents, I mean some of them are one or two paragraphs. They're, mm -hmm. not, they're not very big, right? So uh, You just have to make the point. If it's long, they're not going to read it. Right. Okay. So there's things like possession of the apartment. Uh, this is an, an, an excerpt from the renter's agreement, which is sent with late notices, which makes reference to see the rental agreement. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, or there's a late invoice, which has the fees on it. So you can send them a late invoice. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, friendly reminders, right? Collector of late fee. Now, Here's the deal. You've just recently learned this, but uh, most tenants are are a little goggled up here because they think their rent is due on the tenth. Mm -hmm. not, they, think they, they think they have till the tenth legally. Not pay. the first. Right, and I actually looked it up exactly to see what it says. So here's my point. You can kind of beat them up a bit, and I've done this on the first, and all it does is make them dig their heels in. Well, on uh, the first of the month? 
Yeah. Rent's due on the first. Yeah. Actually, for me, it's the 25th. I do the 25th, but yeah. just for conversation. So, so you could beat them up on the first and uh -huh. send them the harsh notices. But if you send them a friendly reminder or an invoice with a late fee on it, then they know. You can but, send them a warning. Yeah, but the late fee, you said that kicks in on the 4th? Yeah. Well, okay. it depends when you write the lease. Yeah. But if they're for, if they're late on the 1st, by the time they get the letter, you write it and get it, it'll be the 5th. Mm -hmm. Usually, right? Okay. So you can write a warning, right? Uh, use the warning notice to collect late fees if the tenant has not paid you the rent. Yep. You can, you can write them. You can send them a late fees due notice. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or you can request for payment, which is a gentle way of asking for the rent. Mm. Right. Or a delinquent notice. Okay. Or rent is overdue. Mm-hmm. Right? A late notice that warns them uh, that it's going to get worse. Right? If you don't perform, then you're out. Eviction. The big E word comes along. Yeah. Right? Uh, payment is overdue. Second notice. Payment is overdue. Final notice. Mm. Right? And then rent is due on whatever day. Right, so these are all not very complicated letters, right? Yeah. But I mean, there's stuff that you could just by me naming them, right? You could go generate something. You probably find these online. I never lost, but you can probably find something like that online. Oh sure. So like it happened. it's never happened before, huh? Yeah. Right? right. So if they don't, and it elevates, we'll say to the tenth of the month or whatever, whatever your state says. Right. Uh, then you could start. You could start doing some legal notices. Like the first one is a notice to quit. Yeah. It's just a document saying that we have a we have an agreement together, and I'm quitting my end of the agreement because you haven't because you betrayed me. You haven't upheld your end. Right. You could do a three day notice of pay rent or vacate. Mm -hmm. Right. Or you could do a third party notice to vacate, which is a it, uh, it's. It's a, a form is reprinted with permissions of the copyright owner, right? So if you if you were to buy a form from somebody or something like that, you could reprint it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the interest, that's the important note on the ten day thing, uh, at least in Connecticut. Uh, the ten day quote grace period is just the ten days you can't start the eviction process, but after the at the tenth day you can. That's the point of the ten days. It's not like Oh, well, they told me. I didn't have to, oh, they told me le the last landlord said I didn't have to pay till the tenth. No, that was right. the lackey that shows up that doesn't care, not the landlord. Well, I know this is Peter. Is is that uh, while you and I are in the ditches trying to make some money and trying to get our tenants to pay us, mm -hmm. the the governor of this state, the liberal bastard that he is, mm -hmm. is still getting his paycheck and he's still getting his limo rides and he's still eating steak and paying his mortgages, paying his mortgages. He doesn't give a shit. I mean, I just read something this morning. They're now talking about the the infectious disease department of the United States government has just uh, – uh, Trish sent this to me. Uh, Trish, uh, Bill Fusco's girl? Yeah, yeah. One of my coaching clients? Yeah, she works in the, in the uh, town hall, right? Yeah. She just sent me this document that they passed on Monday night, September 1st. Yeah. That rents are not a victim. You can't evict people until December 31st. I don't get it. I don't get it. These people, well, they just think that landlords have tons of money and we just like, I, I don't get it. Bill, I talked to a man, I told you, uh, uh, another uh, real estate investor in my town. I just met these two brothers and one of them runs a coalition in Connecticut with all the different groups, uh, you know, RIAs and landlord associations, a coalition kind of heads it. It's a volunteer thing. So he can go to the Capitol and represent guys like us and talk to them. And I said, yeah. Mr. Bill says, it, they don't care. They understand it. They don't care because they get more people voting for them this way. Yep. You know, 20 tenants instead of one landlord. They don't care. Yep. That's it, period. End of story. They know. They just don't care. What are you going to do when we don't, when we uh, foreclose and everybody gets thrown out on the street? Now what? 
Are they going to go buy them all exactly. up? Are they it's going to go like, buy them all up? Can maybe go buy them. That's right. It's kind of like our presidential race. We have one guy running for the statistics, what the, what the polls say. He'll, he'll say and do whatever the polls say. Mm-hmm. Right. And then another president or another one running for president that wants to actually fix something and has things to do. Now, he may not be the nicest guy in the world, but he is doing something. Right? Well, you know what? There's times when you're not supposed to be nice. Yeah. There's times when you're supposed to be up, up front and straight with people and say, you stole that. You broke that. You broke yep. the rules. You did that. You know, reality time, folks. Anyways, another another uh, another notice you can have is a notice to sue. That one rattles people. There's there's a lawsuit about to happen, right? No, is that for a regular eviction? Or is that more on the lease option kind of deal when they're trying to buy the house? Doesn't matter. What I, what we're talking about is is if they didn't pay the first five or ten days, you you gently nudge them, and then when you hit that ten day period, you 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 increase the gradient. Yeah. And, and sending a notice to suit on the fifteenth, like it's in court, we're going, we're picking a date. Okay. You know, so uh, it makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, I hadn't seen that one to sue, I hadn't, uh, but I've seen all. I think pretty much most of the other ones, and I've sent some of those. You know, and uh, so that's, that's part of the process. Right. So that's 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 throwing a tantrum. You just bombard them. You know, every three or four days, you bombard them, right? Well, you know, it reminds me of because you said like treat them like children and just just handle them. If you tell a kid no ice cream before supper, it's no ice cream before supper. Same way you train a pet. No, you don't get to do that now. You know, and if you give in, you have no control. Every time you just well, here's the thing. If you say something, you have to do it. That's all. Right. So here's the thing. Does a child care about supper? Probably not. He's not even thinking about it. He's not even. He doesn't realize what time of the day it is. If he's a two-year-old kid, he doesn't realize. Oh, he just like he wants ice cream. Yep. So, so you should run your business the way my two-year-old grandson runs his mother. <laughs> yeah, well, he's tenacious. He gets it. He, yeah, right. he's tenacious. He he just goes forward, and he's gonna want to get what he wants to get, and there's nothing she can say or do to stop him. Yeah, and who's gonna you tie should- it up first? Yeah, you should run your business that way, and you'll be buying houses. Yeah, right. So, so the point the point is is that you have to a have some rules, and b you got to keep them in. Yeah. Okay, and that's what we're talking about. Yeah, and that's really what you're saying. It's so so simple that way. If you say something, you have to do it. It's just keeping your word. And how's somebody going to say? I you, how's somebody to argue with you? They signed it. Anytime you watch any of those judge court shows, if you sign something, you sign something. End of story. You can say anything you want. You is that your name at the bottom of the paper? Sorry, sir. You're responsible. Bang. Yep. Done. Rule number two, Peter. Yes, sir. Rule number one is get everything in writing, right? Yeah. Rule number two is you pay attention to what people do, not what they say. Oh, yeah. So your land, your your tenants, whether you're whether you're selling houses or apartments, you know, whatever you have, when they owe you money, they could do some of the most amazing acting jobs you ever saw because their life is depending on it. Mm-hmm. Right? So so that's why we do everything in writing, right? So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because one of the biggest mistakes every landlord I know, including me at times, makes is you you don't send the letters out the next day. Mm. On the second of the month or the third of the month, if they're not paid, you don't, you don't send the letters. You, you let it slide. Yeah. Well, he said he'd pay uh, on on the ninth and his paycheck is like every two weeks. So he'll pay you on the ninth. Yeah. Right. And then it doesn't happen. Right. So I had a tenant that I had acquired and was having all kinds of trouble with, and he was always paying late. He was kind of always jerking me off, and two things happened. Oh, One, you, you said acquired. You got it with the property, not somebody that you picked. Right. That's a big difference, folks. We pick them more carefully, but when you buy properties, you get what you get, and that's sometimes why you get the property because of tenants, but you deal with it, and then you get a better one after that. So go ahead. Right. So I actually paid 500 bucks to go through the eviction process. Hmm. And he let him get it, and he was pissed. So that was one month. 
the next month, you and I were in a seminar in Boston. Mm -hmm. And he was busting my chops all weekend. This is the next month. Yeah. I went to his house. I think I told this story. I went to his house on a Sunday afternoon when we came back from Boston. And I let him know in no uncertain terms, him and her, I made sure both of them, I stood in the kitchen. And I told him, if you think I'm a scum lord or a big fat landlord that's just stealing your money and just, you know, buying cigars and Cadillacs, you got the wrong guy. And I let him know, you don't like me? I'm cool with that. Get out of my house. It was like the ninth or 10th. You got to yeah. the end of the month. You got to the end of the month. If you leave this place, you know, relatively clean, broom swept, I will pay your new landlord $1,500. I'll write a check for $1,500. Just get out. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting up with your crap. If mm -hmm. you stay, you play by my rules. You're costing me too much money and aggravation. I have many other tenants, and all of them combine over a course of three months. Don't give me as much aggravation as you give me in one week. Yeah. And I retrained them. And they and the girlfriend said to me, We'll let you know. Because they said, You think about it? You no, I said to her, You think about it. You got you guys talk amongst yourself. You got to the end of when it goes when it gets dark tonight. If I don't hear from you, I know your answers. You're leaving. She texted me an hour later. We're staying. We'll play by the rules. Yep. But it cost me 500 bucks, and it cost me going to their house. But now, it would have cost me more than that to change the tenants. So the 500 bucks, it would have cost me more than that to try to, you know, it cost me. It's worth it just not to have the aggravation. Yeah. But. Just like what we're talking about, I didn't set them up from the get-go. I didn't set them up from the beginning. Okay. Right? Like you said, I acquired them. Yeah. And yeah. It's, <laughs> it could be harder to train, but you still have that moment in time. New, new sheriff in town, right? Right. You do this once or twice in communities, and the rest of the tenants know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. The tenant wants to do work like add a bathroom, a deck, or refinish the basement, and what do you do? Mm -hmm. All right. Delise says they can do this if they get permission from you in writing. Okay? For small things like paint, carpet, you know, that kind of stuff, I pretty much approve that. Mm -hmm. right? They have to send me before and after pictures, and I need to know what's done. Yep. Okay? You see invoices? But, you look at invoices to see what it was or... No, I just pictures. It. I want a compliance report. Yeah. I want to know that they've complied to the to whatever they told me they were going to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So so if I'm going to approve a repair, I want a compliance report. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, things like major repairs, I tell them they need to get a permit from the town before we go anywhere, which will include some sort of a plan, you know, like a drawn out written plan because you're not going to get a permit from the town unless you do that. And so I want to see the permit, and I want to see the plan. Mm -hmm. Now, got to be very careful here, mm -hmm. because it depends on what type of deal you have with your seller. Oh, okay. Now, on a rent-to-own where I'm just renting from my seller and renting you know, a sandwich lease option, not a slot deal, a sandwich lease option where I stayed in the middle, my decisions are going to have to either go back to the seller. Right. Or I'm going to nip him in the bud and say, no, you can't do that. Right. Because it's the seller's house still. He's got, he owns it still. Right. So you really, really shouldn't do any kind of changes to the house without his permission. Right. Okay. So I'm going to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but I'm going to explain something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I was on the road and I was selling consulting, um, I studied sales quite a bit, as people know, and I'm pretty good at it. Yeah, 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 right? So what's that? You are. Oh, okay. So um, it's the truth. Okay, it's the truth. <laughs> so I did I did a test because this is actually Grant, Grant Cardone material. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think it's in uh, – Get sold or be sold or something, whatever the name of that book is. Sold or get sold? Yeah, one of those, right? Sell, so, sell, yeah. so Grant Cardone was, and I took it a step further than what he did, but that's where I first got the concept many years ago, right? So the point is, is this, that there are misdirectors. 
In other words, there's objections, stalls, and resistance. So people will give you excuses to misdirect you. Like, mm. Peter, how much money do you have in the bank? Right? So, so you could you could either answer the question or not want to answer the question and misdirect me like, I don't know, I have to go look. Yeah. Or why do you, you know, or something like, uh, you have to ask my wife that question. That's a perfect misdirection. You know. I but the books, I don't really know. What's that? My wife does the books. I don't really know. Yeah. So there you go. That's a misdirection. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's the point. Those objections, stalls, or resistance, Grant Cardone stated that better than 80 to 85% of them are complaints. So, like, just, just complaints, not legitimate concerns? They're just That's, complaining. Yeah. I don't have any money. They're just complaining. Right? I don't have enough time. They're just complaining. Right? That's all it is. So he says you acknowledge that. Okay, I got it. You don't have enough time. But can you do it anyways? Yeah. And, and you ask the question again. All you do is acknowledge it and then ask. You don't take it up because if you take it up, you, well, why don't you have time? Oh, no. Next, you, next you thing you know, you're... Next thing you know, you're on a tangent. You're somewhere else. You're 10 minutes or 20 minutes, not, and you don't even remember where you were. You lost yeah. track of the path you were on. You didn't get your ans answer to your question. Do you want to buy it, or do you want to do it? Right? So get that? So, yeah, so you're saying there's a really big difference between a real problem that you need to deal with and just a distraction and a complaint and a blah, 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 blah. If somebody has a real concern... You'll 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 know that, and you can help them with it. Although, because that could get in the way. But complaining is just complaining. Ignore it. That's Instead right. Acknowledge it and move on. Acknowledge it and move on. You don't take it up. Right. That's the point. Is you don't take it up. Now, yeah. here's the amazing thing: the person I'm talking to may not even know they're doing this. It oh, could yeah. be totally subconscious. It's just a normal reaction. Blah 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 blah. They just yeah. This right. that's just how they operate. So you get that concept, right? That's in that's in a sales cycle. Okay. Yeah. So what I do in a sales cycle is they have to bring it up two, three, four times before I handle it. Well, that might mean that it actually is a concern then, and then you deal with it. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Because you, you might not know what it is, right. but if it keeps coming up, all right. right. Then, there's something to yeah, that, then I'm like, okay, maybe this is real. Yeah. So... When I hear objections or stalls or resistance, when I ask for something, mm -hmm. I immediately think always, because of Grant Cadone, thank you, Grant, that they're complaining. Mm -hmm. Now, wait a minute, Peter. Wait a minute. Stop the train. <laughs> I got two wives, an ex-wife and a current wife. I've got two sisters, and I've got two daughters. I've been to the boot camp of complaining. Okay. Oh, yeah. I've been there, done that, watched the movie, hung up the t shirt. <laughs> so, how does this work with them, Bill? So, my point in bringing this up at this, at this time is that when your tenant, right, or your, your, your person that's sending you alarming text that something's broken, like, for example, I, I, you heard me on the phone this morning with the plumber before we started. Right. I have a tenant that called me on on uh, today's Thursday, on Tuesday, and then again on Wednesday that she has a problem with her bathroom sink. Mm -hmm. I know she's crazy. Okay? So I haven't even responded to her. I'm not going to respond to her. So you don't even think that's a legitimate problem yet. So you ignore it and maybe it goes away. <laughs> Yes. No, 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 no. No, I'm not going to get in the middle of it because she's going to tell me all her stories and her woes. No, what I did is you heard me on the phone this morning. I said to my plumber, here's her phone number. Can you call her and tell her you're coming? Okay. That's it. So Janet, Janet, 
Janet's giving me a hard time telling me I'm being a sexist. Boo, because I said I got a wife, two wives, sister. Janet, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> you need to meet them. <laughs> but fair enough. I got the point. So here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you ignore when they send you the text. But don't take it for its face value. Mm. Maybe ask a few questions. You, you know, <laughs> Janet says you're forgiven. Thank you. So he, here's a neat little trick, Peter. Yeah. This is a neat little trick. And it's so simple, but yet so effective. Mm -hmm. So uh, the tenant texts me and says, Bill, there's water leaking. Mm. You know what my text is? Take a picture. Let me see. Mm. Take a small video. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Can you FaceTime? Yep. Right? Because what the tenant thinks is a huge leak may not be what you think, or vice versa. I just paid $2,300 to fix a, fix a bathroom because the tenant didn't tell me for six months it was leaking. Mm. And it cost me more money. Yeah. Because I could have probably fixed it for 500 three months ago. Yeah. Right. So, mm. so when they when when we're talking about repairs, right, and we're talking about you know uh, the tenant doing things like that, just have them take pictures. Mm. Okay. Then you can see what it really is: big deal, or small deal, or yeah. I mean, technology is amazing nowadays with cell phones, you know, so just have them take a picture. Yeah. But uh, the point is, is that 80, 80, according to Grant Cardone, which I believe in because I tested this on the road 40 weeks a year, 10, 12 clients a week, and I tested it, and, and it, I'll be, he, he, he's pretty spot on. Mm. Right? Good. All right, so uh, working on getting the buyer approved. I want to make sure that we didn't, I don't know how we got back on repairs, but we were covering tenant wants to do work and uh, bathroom and they want to add a deck or something like that. Do you feel like we've covered that? Yeah, um, I, I said it before, but I, I was reading uh, some email from another landlord in the area that sends informational, he's a management guy, and he pointed out that you think it's great that they're going to paint, but they can make a real mess. Uh, they can do the thing wrong, so it's not a great thing that they're doing it unless you have the approval, permits, pictures, plan, you know, on something bigger. So right. just, just because it's all an improvement, it could be a, a little bit of a disaster. So done right, the way you're saying, is smart. So I, I, want, to, I want to reiterate here, uh, and, I, and I really don't have time to do this because we've got quite a bit more to do here, but uh, I would like to reiterate past podcasts. One of your profit centers is that you buy a house that needs repairs, mathematically correct. So you adjusted for the repairs. Mm -hmm. Normal formulas, the way we always do. Right. Then when you acquire the house, instead of doing the repairs, you assign those repairs to your buyer. Mm -hmm. And you make more money. Now, if it's you know if it's twenty thousand dollars with the repairs, you're not going to give the, the the tenant or the the, the lease purchaser twenty thousand dollars in credits. Yeah. Right. You might give them ten. Right. The point is is that you allowed for this. So when I hear your statement about they paint the room and they mess it up, if you did what I I trained you to do earlier. You're going to have money in the deal. So if they do, it doesn't matter. You can have money and you're just going to go in and fix it anyways. What's the big deal? Mm -hmm. it, it's a gamble. I mean, you're rolling the dice. So, yeah, on the smaller stuff like that, where your energy goes, no, where your attention goes, your energies go, and results show. Yeah. yeah so where your, where your attention goes, energies flow, and results show. Mm hmm. Where your energy, where your attention goes, energies flow, results show. Yeah. So if you think, oh, I can't let them paint the house because they may not buy it. And I'm going to have to fix it. 
Mm. So what are you going to get? But if you think, if you grant them the ability or the, the beingness, you know, to like, as the owner, like they're going to be the owner, Mm -hmm. then what are you going to get? So you can't, you can't, (laughs) John, that's good. (laughs) John said, uh, because I said where attention goes, we, uh, what is it? Attention goes, energies flow, results show, and he says, and money grows. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, so you understand? So, so you just got to be in, you have to take your own medicine. Stop talking to yourself and saying, well, if, if they paint the room and it's painted wrong, then I'm going to have to fix it later. If you think that that's what you're going to get is, there, is they're going to leave and you're going to have to fix that room because that's, that's what you're like putting there. Yeah. Right? No, just allow them to be who they are and just assume they're going to do it right and just assume that it's their house. So if they ruin it, oh well. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah. so just make sure you get your mindset straight on that. And you mm-hmm. will win a lot better with that formula than, than wondering if they're going to do it wrong and ruin your house. Because it's not your house. You sold it to them, it's their house. They just haven't paid you yet. Right. Right. So you, that's a hard uh, mind shift. Yeah. Right. But once you get it, it works. Okay. Have a little faith. Yeah. Have a lot of faith. All right. So now we got to work on getting the buyer approved. This seems to be more complicated if you haven't heard me talk about it or have done it. So um, here's the little secret. Yes. Use your Rolodex. Get the pros to do the work. In other words, outsource it. You're not doing anything. You're telling the customer, I'm going to get you approved for a mortgage, or I'm going to help you get approved for a mortgage. If you have bad credit, I'm going to help you with that. You're not doing shit. All you're doing is hooking them up with the right people. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the kind of help. Well, that's the best kind of help with a professional. Yeah. You you just make the connections and keep the pressure on all the parties so it keeps moving along to a done. So your job is the scoreboard. You're the scoreboard. Like, you know, I don't know enough about football, but I, I watch it with the guys at the cigar shop. And they, God knows, you know, with Tabucky Jones, they talk about it. That's all they talk about is football and basketball. I was there the other night, and uh, oh, my God, they're, they're all excited. The college, hey, that's something, huh? Did you see – have you watched a basketball game? No, not lately. Um, Peter, you have to you have to watch a basketball game. What are they doing? You have, you have, it's changed the world. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not joking. It's changed what? the world. Oh. Go watch. Go watch a basketball game tonight if you can. Okay. They have virtual audiences. <laughs> it looks like when I first saw it, I'm like, look at all those people there. I thought they weren't supposed to have people. And, and Tabucky goes, "That's virtual." You know, he's not always pleasant and sweet, and you know, flowers and pie, right? Yeah. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's they have like a screen up and it's actual virtual people that are moving and it looks like a crowd. And <laughs> and, and when the guy shoots a basket, they, they all look. clap and cheer. <laughs> oh jeez. It goes to show you how much our world has become the pretenders. Hmm. How many people pretend? How many things we have in our world that are fake and we don't even freaking know it? People put up that social veneer and they pretend like everything's good. Mm. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're doing real estate and you're doing what I'm telling you to do and you're talking to your sellers, once you pierce that social veneer, the deal starts. If you don't, dig in and find out what's going on. So it was it was amazing to me. Virtual audiences. What? What's next? Virtual mm-hmm. pregnancies? Oh my god. Hey, watch this. <laughs> All right. So uh so here's a valuable tip that I have recently started doing. This is on getting them buyers approved. I don't know why I didn't do this earlier, Peter. It's one of those stupid things that when I thought of it or when I figured it out, 
I don't even know why I thought of it. I, I can't even remember the day that it, it popped in my head, but it, it's not something I read or heard or nothing. It's just something that I'm like, oh my God, why didn't I, why didn't I do that 15 years ago? Well, you know, I know you have lease options, but I never hear you talk about, I don't think, I, I think you don't do anything with that because I never hear you talk about it. If you're following up, like, yeah, if they don't do it, they don't do it. So just tell me what you really do. Cause I don't, I don't really never catch that part. Depends on the property. Yeah. Like uh, 78 Rossi, I'm doing this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 144 Clinton. Uh, in fact, I got to pull his file today. I think he's been, he's, I'm not doing it because I got a thousand dollars a month positive cash flow. Yeah. And you keep saying, yeah, but you got a hundred thousand dollars in the back end. Why don't you go get that money? I'm like, eh. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, I would like to have a hundred thousand dollars, but once I have that hundred thousand dollars, I got to put it someplace so it makes me a thousand dollars a month again. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So here's 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 what you do. When they're in the property, about three months. You know, it could be sooner, but once they're in and they're settled in, you ask them to talk to your mortgage person and try to get them approved. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. The point that I'm making is, is you know they're not qualified. Right. But you want to have them go get approved, especially with FHA, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the seller, I'm sorry, the buyer, why do I keep doing that today? The buyer always thinks that it's worse than what it is. Mm. Okay. Number two, you want them to go qualify so that when they disqualify, now you have specifics. See, if they don't, if they say to you, my credit's not bad, I don't qualify, that's a generality. It's like just a general, I just don't qualify. Yeah. You, put them, you put them in with the mortgage person, and now they're like, if you just do this, this, and this, we'll approve you. So... The other way is you just send them to a credit correction place and they start correcting whatever. This way you know what the bank really cares about and that's all you have to concern yourself about. Is that the difference? No. Uh, you're dubbing stuff in. I don't know where you got that from. So, well, I thought you would send them to that credit. What happens, if they have, what happens if they have good credit and they just started a business and need two years worth of tax returns? Why would I do that? Mm. But you would know that. Right. So... Yeah. So my point is, is that everybody's different, mm -hmm. right? So what I'm saying is, is send them into the mortgage guy and find out what, here's one. I'll give you one, the, the one I was just talking about, Side Hill Road. Yeah. That more that mortgage got delayed by two months. You want to know why? Oh, I'm, I, um, I forget, but yeah, some, yeah. She, she was, she was approved. And then he dug in and they got ready to do the closing and they found out that she needed 17000 or 13000 I think it was $17,000 more money. And he didn't call her and tell her that because he was a spineless mortgage guy that was like, eh, she's not going to want to do this. He made the decision that she didn't have the money because she doesn't look like a person that has that kind of money. Mm. Guess what? She's been on the job for 9,000 years and had a retirement fund or something and was able to borrow the money in the retirement fund and wanted that house so bad she as soon as i told because i called as soon as i found that out i called her five minutes later she's like why didn't he tell me that we could have done this like two months ago i have the money he never called her and told her unbelievable and it was it held the mortgage up for two months because i'm calling i'm like what's going on i'm working on it. i'm working on it. i'm working he was lying to me yeah right so but it was her mortgage guy. I can't fire him. She, she'd have to. Right? She was pissed after that. I point blank told her, if you want another mortgage guy, we'll close in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. right? That's why you send him to the mortgage people, because you want, you want to find out, you want to get the specifics. Now, it could be the crummiest thing in the world. It could be, you know, you got to go to jail for 15 years and, and get your record clean, and then we'll give you the mortgage. You know what I mean? But at least you know what it is. Yeah. Right. You know what you're up against. Yeah. Right. So, so that's the trick is as soon as you get them in there, the sooner the better. Now, if you don't care, you got a subject to deal and you're, you're going for the, the, the cash, you know, the, the surf is giving you a lot of cash, then you don't need to do this. But, you know, like the, the house I got in, uh, in, in, in Bristol, right. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the plumber guy that I just talked to. Yeah. Right. 
uh, they they have attention on one. And, and there's not that much money. There's like 15 grand in the back end. There's mm -hmm. not much money for me. I got most of it now. Mm -hmm. You know, I make $290 a month positive cash flow. It's like, I can replace that house. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll just, I'll, I, so they're, they have special needs kids, autistic, uh, you know, they, they do foster home stuff. And so they're going through some special mortgage with that stuff. They get special rates because of that right. stuff. Yeah. Right. Of course, uh, COVID didn't help anything, but. Can I ask you a question so, then? Yeah. So once they go and they know what's wrong at the bank, what's the next step? You you do whatever you want to do, whatever you got to do. I mean, do they need help from one of those credit correction lawyer type places or they can do it on their own? Why do you keep asking that question? I thought that's what you do. That might, I don't I don't know this part. What, 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 hap what happens if they don't have bad credit? Well, I'm asking if they do have a problem. Yeah. Yes. So can they, they purchase themselves or they need professional help, or you just you can decide based on what it is. Say that again. I thought that the way to fix this, you sent them to correct credit correction bureau guys. That's how I thought you did this. Okay, but I've just told you three times that's not true. So change your yeah. consideration or stop well, asking the question. That's I'm just this, that's not my question. Once you see what's wrong, like at the bank. If it is credit repair, then yes, I'll send them to a credit agent. In fact, the guy that I use is uh, his name is Stephen Robert, uh -huh. and his his name of his place is Bedrock Credit Restoration. He's in Danbury, Connecticut. I'm going to give you his phone number, so write it down. Uh, his phone number is two zero three nine three nine three four four seven. Okay, he's in Danbury, Connecticut. Works all over the country, mm -hmm. right? His name is Stephen Robert, Bedrock Credit Restoration. Phone number is 203-939-3447. Tell him I called. He may or may not know me. We use him a lot. We don't use him at all. He's done. He's been on our coaching calls. I mean, he, whatever. He, he may. I don't talk to him every day. He's not like one of my regular contacts. Mm -hmm. But if, if you do have a credit problem, and you are right, a lot of times it is that, but don't assume that. That's why I'm giving you a hard time. Don't assume that, which is the exact reason why I'm bringing this up, because for 15 years, that's what I did. I assumed that they had a credit problem. Yeah. By sending them into the mortgage company, because guess what, Peter? What? FHA doesn't care about credit. What, like credits, when you say credit, credit score? No, I said what I meant. Credit? You're 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 doing something else. When you say credit, I don't know what you mean. All I know is so, credit. So what's the purpose of a credit score? Just to see if they been been paying bills, uh, have credit card available, equity. I don't know. There's all those parameters. So what credit. I what um, I heard what I heard is I don't know. That's what I heard. Yeah, I just see my credit score is based on how much credit, how much. Room I have on my credit cards, how much I'm paying on them, if I'm paying on time, things like that. I don't know exactly what all of that covers, but okay, so basically, what a credit score is, is I don't know you, Peter, and you're asking to borrow money from me. Mm -hmm. I don't know who you are. I've never met you. I have no history with you. Mm -hmm. So supposedly, a credit agency is going to give me in a snapshot your normal operating basis, your history. And by doing that, I can find out what kind of a person you are. Like, you don't pay your bills on time. You could give a shit. So if you don't give a shit about paying your credit card bills or your gas bill or your electric bill, you're not going to give a shit about paying me. Yeah. Or if your credit is one of the things that you worry about the most, like right now you're telling me what a great credit score you have because you're worried about your credit, then you're going to pay me because you're not going to want to have your credit screwed up. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately, the credit bureaus are in with the bankers, and they're all corrupt. Right. So the biggest problem with a credit agency is, is they they charge you for a report like me. If I did a credit report, they charge me for that credit report to find out your history. Hmm. If they don't have something to report, are you going to want to pay me? No. OK, so it's very easy for them to report things. They want to have derogatory credit on their reports. So the person paying them will say, I'm glad I paid them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And it's very hard to get things off of your credit because if you cleaned your credit up and had a 700 score and didn't have anything that they could report, then the person buying the report after a while is going to say, well, most nine out of 10 people come back as good anyways because there's nothing on it. That doesn't work. I'm not going to buy that no more. Yeah. Right. So they, these companies, and you would think that I'm a conspiracy theorist when you listen to all this stuff. I'm really not. It's just, I, I just been around this stuff so much. Right, because you got to realize, I used to sell forty cars a month, mm -hmm. and and every car had thirty eight documents that went to the bank. Thirty eight documents. I mean, when I when I stopped when I stopped in 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 two thousand nine, I still had I think seven or eight hundred car loans on the road. I still collect money from those people every month. Eleven years later, so. When I talk about this stuff, I'm just not talking out my ass like a conspiracy theorist. I'm talking about somebody that sat in front of dozens and dozens of people every single week and tried to get them approved for a car loan. And then later, mortgages. Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm not just being a, a you know some you know talking head over here. I'm talking from experience. Right? So the credit repair guy knows what to attack and what not to attack and what letters to write because he knows that if he doesn't get the credit agency's attention legally, right, then they're not going to listen because they're, 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 they're faceless. They're like the bankers. They're yeah. faceless. I mean, you know the teller, but you don't know who owns the bank. Who owns TD Bank anyways? So, Mr. TD. <laughs> yeah. Who, who owns American National Bank? Yeah. Right? You yeah. know, they're, they're faceless businesses. They're cowards. They hide behind their entities. Right? You know who I am. I don't hide. No, I don't have all the millions that they have either, and I don't have people trying to attack me because of it, But and I get that part too, but that's the way the credit agencies are. So, anyways, we spent way too much time on that. The, the point is, is that you actually get them into a mortgage company and you actually get them to find the specifics so you can work on that or not work on it, mm -hmm. right? You know that they're going to, you tell them at, at six months, here's the deal. You're not going to be able to fix it. You have a contract with me for another year and a half. You're going to need to get out mm -hmm. and just set the pace because they don't qualify, mm -hmm. which is okay too, right? Yeah. How about how about this, Peter? I, I I didn't I did want to cover this. We're at an hour and a half, and I and I really want to finish because I don't want to go too much longer. How about okay. this, Peter? How about this? You ready? Yeah. So you go in for a mortgage, and you find out that there's something there that they can't get a mortgage. Right. Yep. yep. Watch this. So they got a two hundred thousand dollar house. They gave you ten grand now. Mm. Right. If you can come up with another twenty grand or twenty five grand for a down payment, mm. I'll mortgage you for five years mm. or ten years or whatever it is. Especially if you own it subject to, and you put them on a land contract mm. or, or a bond for deed or a contract for deed. They're all the same document. Mm. And you just you just deal with it. So in a sense, you become the bank. Yeah, but what you do is is you suck all your equity out of it. You make them give you a vast majority of the equity, so it's worth you staying there. Yeah, well, you you always if you lose something, you ask for something to replace it to even the score, and it's right. fair because they're screwed. So you're helping them find a way to do it. It costs them because it's 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 a pain for well, you. So you're well, even the well, score. What better time to do that than you go through the whole process, you put them in the house, and then you send them to the bank right away. It's still all fresh to them in their head. It didn't go away for two years. Yeah. It's all fresh to them, and they're still thinking about buying this house. They go to the bank, and the bank says, uh-uh-uh. Mm. Now you're like, you know what? That's not bad. Just just see it. you got a year and a half, or you got a year, because then you got to start talking about getting out of here in you know, six months to get out of here. Mm. I have a lease with you. You can stay. However, if you come up with, you know, whatever the number is, 25 grand, I'll mortgage you for five years, seven years, 10 years, whatever. 
Where attention goes, energies flow, results show. You just put their attention on what? All I got to do is come up with 25 grand. Well, maybe I can borrow from grandpa or maybe I could do this or maybe I could do that. Or, you know, I get a bonus at the end of the year. They got a year and a half to figure it out. You just keep nudging them. How's it going on the 25 grand? Mm. How's it going on the 25 grand? How's it going on the 25 grand? And you keep re-stimulating their attention. Mm -hmm. So it keeps going back to it. See? Sure. Okay. All right. So uh, getting ready to close. Okay. So once your buyer notifies you that they are ready to close because your lease, your, your option agreement says they have to give you written day notice. It's usually 15, sometimes it's 30 day notice. Uh, you're changing the deal. So once they send you the notice, because the option agreement, again, I'm going to say to repeat it, yeah. the option agreement says when they're ready to execute the option, they need to send you a notice in writing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it might be a text, but they're going to send you a notice in writing. Okay. You're going to change the deal now. This is important. You're going to change the deal. You're going to go from having an option agreement with them because an option agreement cannot close a real estate deal. Right. It just holds it until it's ready to be closed. Right. Right. So you're going to switch it from an option, you know, the rights to buy to they're going to buy. And the way you do that is you is you draft up or strike, as they say, you strike a purchase and sales contract. So when they send you the notice, you draft up a regular standard, you know, purchase and sales contract like the MLS does, like the like the realtors do. Okay. Mm -hmm because you can't close with the option, right? When you write the purchase and sales contract, make sure you attach the option agreement to the purchase and sales contract, or at least let somebody know that you're not the owner. Mm. Because one of the things that you're gonna do is you're gonna, if you don't tell whoever the closing agent is, you know, your buyer's closing agent, you'll spook them. Oh, oh yeah. They'll think they'll think you're selling a house, but you don't own it. That's that would look weird. As soon as they do the title search, which yeah. often sometimes is right away, sometimes it's not. They're mm -hmm. going to realize your name's on the deed, and they're like, "What is this? This is a scam!" Right away, they're going to think it's a scam. Mm -hmm. Wasn't like this ten years ago, but now everything's a scam. I mean, Emma thinks if the if the if the orange juice is in the apple juice island, it's a scam. I mean. <laughs> That's the way millennials are. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm stereotyping, but I know that she's that way. You know what I mean? And she thinks everything's a scam, right? And she's probably more right than I am. You know, I got a text on my, I've been getting text on my, on my, on my telephone for five days now saying I have a UPS package. I don't know if it's a scam. I don't know what to do. Why, the, why are they texting me? Yeah. I've seen that too. Like there's no package. Uh, well, there's a link. I'm not pushing the link. I know that yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. You don't push it, and it goes away in a couple of days. But that is weird. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, I had one. My my ex sister in law. Her name is Allison. Which, ironically enough, I just talked to her like three weeks ago. It's the first time I talked to her in ten years, really? eight years. I talked to her because there was some stuff we had to cover, some family stuffs going on, and she wanted to talk to me about it. Right. Mm-hmm. Two days ago, I get a message saying they're looking for Allison. They used to work with her, and they and they and she used to go by Michelle. And, and I'm like, so I called her last night. I'm like, who's this guy looking for? Why is he calling me? How does he even know we're connected? She's like, I never heard of that guy. He gave me his name, his phone number, everything. Huh? Uh, uh, he wants me to call him back. Yeah, I don't think so. There's a little red button on my phone that says delete. But how does that shit so so I get Emma's point because how does shit like that happen? Yeah. Right. Well, everything's being washed. I started looking for to purchase uh uh some car wax, some bed sheets, and all I get on Facebook is car wax and bed sheet ads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're watching. So the big thing is is when you're when you're when you're uh closing a deal is you don't spook anybody or surprise anybody. You let them know up front, just like everything else we do. You know, I have an option agreement with this property. It's all legal. When you go do the title search, it's the seller, but I have all the seller's documents. I'll send them to you as you need them. Mm -hmm. Right. And you don't do that. You do not do that 
for willy nilly. You, you don't send them to your buyer so he can send them to the mortgage guy. You send them to the closing agent and the mortgage guy can get them from the closing agent. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's an attorney. I send everything to the attorney and then if they want it, the attorney can have it. I'm sorry, the, the, the mortgage guy can have it. Depends on what they're asking for. But you don't want to release private information from you and your seller to just anybody. So right. make sure you're releasing it to the right people. And just use your head with them, right? So if you if you don't give them a you know tip them off about this, uh, the deal will just get hard. The day that happens, when they find out there, they think that you're like scamming them. The deal just gets hard, and often they blow up. Mm. So just make sure you start the deal off right with the purchase and sales. Company. But the attorneys understand options. It's not a weird thing. They they do it. They understand Lisa. Yeah, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with it. It's just why didn't you tell me is always the answer. Like, you know, like the seller, uh, I'm sorry, the buyer is in the house for a year and a half, and they're like, why didn't you tell me? You know, or whatever. I, I mean, I, I'm making things up, but you, but you get it. Yeah. Right. I'm just saying three. normal stuff. Realtors yeah. know about it, lawyers know about it. Uh if you don't say it, it makes it look weird. But if you do say it, they do this. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk to a new lawyer. Her father is my, uh, my mechanic. He used to be a broker. They used to do lease options decades ago. It's right. not new weird stuff. It's not right. new weird stuff. Yeah, so so to end oh, off on to end off on it. <laughs> don't make that? it don't make it weird. <laughs> yeah. So and to end off on a billism, right? The realtors have done a really good job of saying what we do is alternative real estate. Mm. And people accuse those of what they themselves are doing because the real estate system is the alternative. Mm -hmm. The stuff we're talking about has been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Eat, eat that. <laughs> so we're over now, Peter. Don't uh, make sure you go check out my new monthly mastery. It's flippinghousesforrookies.com forward slash uh, monthly mastery. Flipping houses for rookies dot com forward slash monthly mastery let me make sure that link is right uh yeah okay and then um also make sure you uh subscribe to the channel you're listening to you can go check us out on youtube you can check us out uh you know on facebook wherever you normally watch us and Make sure that you uh, leave us a review. Okay? Please. Because, yes, please, please. You can do that right on flippinghousesforrookies.com. Um, if you just go there, you can go to the, the podcast link, you know, right below the podcast, and it says leave us a review. And we made it real simple. All right? So the good, the bad, and the ugly has been presented to you, and at this particular point, I think that you could uh, go off and uh, find a good tenant and manage your properties and, uh, I didn't get around to this, and, and I'm not going to, but at the end, there is another way to do all this. Uh, you could manage the manager, mm -hmm. uh, and that simply means you hire a property management company and you manage them through profit and loss statements and numbers, and there's a lot of people who do that. That's an old, that's an old apartment thing, but when you're first starting, you don't need to do that. Right? You manage the property. You're being the manager, so you manage the property, so, or you manage the manager, one or the other. You have to choose that type of a, a scenario, and then you're good. Okay? Yep. All right, Peter, thank you very much. We're over and out. We'll talk to you next week.